So once I was at, at Shambhala Mountain Center, which is a land center in this lineage in Colorado, that's really, really beautiful. Has anybody ever been there besides Jenna? It's really awesome. If you ever have a chance to go there, please go there. There's something there called a stupa, which is uh, a building that's built to honor the memory of a great teacher. And the stupa there is built to honor the memory of Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche. And there are three floors. The first floor is public. The second floor is for people doing a particular practice. And you can only go to that floor if you're doing that practice. And the third floor is even smaller, and it's for another practice. And you can only go there if you're doing that practice. Oh, yes, you're right. Yeah, that's a stupa right there. Thank you, on the shrine. That's the kind of building that it is. But it's much bigger than that. <laughs> um, and so there was a, a cello player, a, a world-renowned cello player, came to Shambhala Mountain Center and l fell in love with it. And he was the winner of the Pablo Casals competition in Europe. And he was at Shambhala Mountain Center with Pablo Casals' cello. And he's like, I'd like to take this cello and make a recording. And I think, that, you know, from what I understand, I've not been on the third floor of the stupa, but that's the best acoustics. I'd like to make a recording there and then just give it to you to sell to benefit Shambhala Mountain Center. And Shambhala Mountain Center was like, we will take you up on that. And I used to work in the music business, and I had some experience doing this. So I got in charge of making the recording. And I found a 24-track mobile unit to drive up the mountain. And, and we got permission from Shambhala Mountain Center to go to the third floor, even though none of us were doing that practice. And <coughs> my meditation teacher happened to be on the land at that time. And I was concerned, like, how can we do that? It's like just tromping into someone's yard and you know, walking all over their garden. I mean, how can we go into that space without <coughs> all, you know, sort of spiritual authorization? What, you know, what's the karma in that? How can we make that okay to do? And at this time, we happened to be walking around the stupa and he said, oh, that's easy. You just uh, make offerings, request blessings and dedicate the merit. That's all he said. <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> so I'm telling you that. To keep your practice sacred, spiritual, not, you know, precious, but really deep, these are the three steps. And I'll tell you just very briefly what, what is meant by these three steps. Make offerings and request blessings you do before your practice. Then you do the practice. Then you dedicate the merit. So uh, make offerings, like all of these things on this shrine, these are offerings. These bowls represent different things and the lights and the beautiful book that's wrapped in that brocade and some shrines have flowers, often shrines have incense. Things that evoke the sense perceptions are often used as offerings. And you know, if you have a place where you meditate, you can have, you know, you don't have to make it like this, but you can have offerings or, you know, at your, wherever it is you meditate. And they can be flowers or a picture of something that, or someone that inspires you. Um, you can light incense. You can, you know, create a little shrine. Not because it's something you saw in a picture, but because it's a way for you to place offering substances and offer those offerings, as it were. However, the best offering is always what you are experiencing right now. Who are you right now? How do you feel? What is your experience? That's the best offering. So before your practice, if you connect with that, I feel tired, I feel grumpy, I feel fabulous, I feel confused, I feel all of those things, and just rouse this sense of, I give all of that to my practice. That's a very good offering. The second step is to request blessings. So it's like, well, what are you making an offering to? So if you have a traditional practice, like me, I'm very traditional, then I request the blessings of my teachers. And the, p the teachers of this lineage, I, like they're in this case, they're chants that are the request for the blessings. And you ask them, please, Padmasambhava, 
you know, Tilo, Naro, Marpa, Mila, please, everybody, I'm, I hold your lineage. Please bless me as I practice in whatever way, whatever that means to me or them. Um, but you don't have to have that to request blessings because we are all part of a lineage or lineages because nobody just poof got here in a cloud of smoke. So you could be in the lineage of Christians or Jews or Muslims or Hindus. Sh you could be in the lineage of shamans or, you know, goddess lovers or whatever it is that your lineage is, that's great. But you could also be in the lineage of um, teachers or mothers or friends or activists or gardeners or lovers or poets. Whatever you aspire to, whatever you long for, whatever you connect to most deeply, that's your lineage. It could be the lineage of Italians or the lineage of Armenians. And so when you sit down to practice, you could rouse a sense of your lineage. So for me, like I say, it's my teachers, but I also think of Bob Dylan <laughs> and the poet Rilke and my grandparents and great-grandparents who I never met. And I sort of imagine in, my, you know, in some way that my Buddhist teachers are sitting on my left and my grandparents from the Ukraine are sitting on my right and I ask them to bless me in some way that feels right to me. There's no way that I can tell you how to do that. But just, I, I, I came from you. I am continuing your work or your way. I'm the next in line. And please support me. And so you can request the blessings of your lineage or lineages in just some simple way. Or you can make it complicated. And then you do your practice. And at the end of your practice, you do what's called dedicate the merit, which simply means if you're in a traditional practice, there's words you say, by the confidence of the golden sun of the great east, may the lotus garden of the Rigdon's wisdom bloom, and so forth and so on. And you can say your own words, though, or you don't even have to say words. You just get the sense of whatever just happened in my practice, good, bad, or ugly, whatever I felt, whatever I saw, whatever obstacles I ran into, however bored I was or intrigued, I bundle all that up and I offer it so that it could somehow benefit others. That's what is the dedicate the merit part. You dedicate the merit of your practice. And it doesn't just mean when you practice well. It means anything that happens is the merit because that's what happened while you were practicing and you let go of it. You just whoop. I hope what I don't know how my grumpy practice could benefit others, but I offer it so that it may. Does that make sense? And as I hope you can see, there's nothing religious about that. It's very intimate, which is very important for your practice to be intimate. So there's some other things I was going to say, but I'm just going to say one more thing, and then we can have a conversation. Um, there are traditional obstacles, you know, in classical Buddhist thought, there are three main obstacles to practice. The first one is called laziness, which there are three kinds. The second one is called forgetting the instructions. Just remind yourself. And the third one is called laxity slash elation, which means being too bored or too excited in your practice, and both of which are considered obstacles. But I'm just going to focus on one of the three kinds of laziness. The three kinds are regular, Let's see, what, what am I binge watching these days? I can't even remember. That's how <laughs> spaced out I am sometimes. Uh, and it binge watching something or just going, eh, I don't feel like it. You know, regular laziness, which we're all quite acquainted with. The second kind of laziness is called becoming disheartened, which is interesting that that's considered a form of laziness. It's like, oh, this will never work. Or I'm really not very good at this. Or other people are becoming Dalai Lamas and I'm still a loser and <laughs> that kind of thing. That's considered lazy because you've forgotten how awesome you are and you've letten, you've lettened, you've allowed your la, 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 to become the loudest voice. But the third kind of laziness is the one that I want to um, highlight and that form of laziness is called being too busy. 
And in Buddhist thought, being too busy is thought to of as a kind of laziness. And, you know, that's kind of counterintuitive to us because we think the people who are the most industrious and important are the busiest. And if you don't have time to do anything, it's because you're important and you just don't have time because too many demands on you and too many people, whatever, you have too many responsibilities, whatever it might be. But in Buddhist thought, that is considered a form of laziness because you've let your priorities get upside down. And rather than placing at the top of the priority list your inner life, the discovery of the meaning of your life, the strengthening and investment in your own particular brand of brilliance, those things fall to the bottom of the list. And I have to answer my email that's the top of the list. And yeah, you do have to, everybody has to, and so on. But when you constantly let this one go and just forget about it, then that's thought to be a kind of laziness. So that's just an inter interesting way of looking at it. Um, because the real priority is who you are and feeling that. And then the very last thing I'm going to say is, uh, I've been on long meditation retreats that, that start every morning with the precepts. You make these vows. You know, the normal vows that people ask you to make if you're starting out on a spiritual path, like, I, I, I'm not going to drink, you know, I'm not going to get drunk, I'm not going to be inappropriately sexual, I'm not going to lie, I'm not going to steal, I'm not going to kill anyone. The basics. <laughs> and you know, every morning you say that, and you're kind of like, okay. But the thing that I loved about the precepts in Buddhist practice is that they're only for that day. That's why you say them every day. Because the next day you say them again. And if you, and the, uh, if someone said, but we're having a party tonight, and what if I want to have a glass of sake? Our teacher said, well, just give that vow back. <laughs> <laughs> Which I thought was awesome. <laughs> and extremely creative, actually, and very kind. So it didn't say you have to be perfect. It was like, take these vows. If you're, if you're going to screw one up, I know, but l consciously and intentionally return it. Say, I'm, that, I, I'm giving that vow back for now. And so in your meditation practice, you can make some kind of a vow. I am going to practice for 10 minutes a day, five days a week, for one month, whatever that is. And then if the third day comes up and you don't practice, Give the vow back for that day. And that's it. You're done. You've completed your practice. And then the next day, resume. And if that day you're like, oh, I'm not going to do it, give it back again. But make it very crisp and very clear and very intentional. And there are no penalties or bonuses in either case. But it's you working with yourself that is the real practice. So that's what I wanted to say. I think we have a little bit of time left, 10 minutes but or so, if you have any questions. Yes. We have a mic coming around for the recording. Oh, good. Thank you. Um, I think like the biggest impediment that I face, and, and I find a lot of people who are like me you know, think similarly is, you know, I grew up in a very dangerous environment. So that kind of left me disinclined to ever really relax. So what happens is when I undertake a meditation practice, um, there's this basic feeling that I'm kind of broken. You know what I'm saying? And that no matter what I do, it's not really going to be permanent. Because when you grow up, and I'm not really trying to draw attention to myself here, but when you grow up in, in a really um, dangerous environment, your brain kind of wraps around the idea that you're always under duress. So what I think that I took the wrong approach to meditation all these years, I was just more looking for to be anesthetized as opposed to be comfortable with myself. And I find that the biggest impediment I have for getting on the cushion is um, I have this prevailing thought that I need to be to feel okay right now, right? And I think a lot of people take that same attitude toward meditation, and I think that dissuades a lot of people because obviously it's not gonna happen right away. 
Thank you so much for saying those things. And can I ask you what your practice is? When, generally, and this is being really honest, when things are going well in my life, because you know, kind of despite how I grew up, I, I did make myself halfway decent. Um, things are going well in my life. I show up. Uh, I practice. And what I do you practice? I, I have a. Uh, I have. Because it's very hard for me to sit still. So I mean, I have. I have what I like to call physical meditation, which is because I'm a pro boxer. So when after I box, it's very easy for me to relax. So generally, after my daily boxing practices, I'll sit and do seated meditation. Now, this only happens when my world is not completely in a whirlwind and I can wrap my brain around the idea of doing it. Now, if there's anything, and it can be something minor, if there's anything that's making me feel like I'm under duress, I don't, I don't have a practice. Mm -hmm. And it's antithetical because you really should be practicing more when things are not going well. Mm -hmm. So when things are going well, it's real easy for me to practice. Mm -hmm. And I think that that inconsistency led toward, you know, I've never really gotten a, a great benefit out of it. But I keep, I keep coming. I keep trying. And I really, like, appreciate the way you put things. You made it very easy to, to discern my feelings tonight. So yeah, thank no. you very much. Yeah, I appreciate you're that. You're welcome. And I thank you for that. And I have a couple suggestions. Um, and I'm sure people can and can't relate to what you said because not everyone grew up in that way more or less, but everyone can relate to when I'm under duress, I, my practice gets further away from me, I think, because it's too scary to say I'm going to sit with this agitation for good reason, and, and nobody should force themselves to do it, because when you sit and you start to soften, you start to relax, and what you're holding at arm's length immediately comes up, which for most people is they're just tired and they fall asleep. Did everybody hear that? Okay. Um, so when it comes to things like panic and trauma, and th that, that's a different category. And that is something that needs a special kind of approach. And do you have a meditation instructor? Yes, I do. You do have one? Yes. Oh, good, good, good. Oh, that's great. So is that helpful? Um, yes, because when I put the effort in, you know, a lot of the times when, when I'm walking around, I'm, I'm kind of walking around in a, in a fight or flight all the time. Mm -hmm. Th there's the only thing I'm going to focus on is what I think is going to make me feel better at that moment, which gets me in a lot of trouble <laughs> sometimes. Well, then I, here's the practice that I want to give to you for those times. And it's not the practice of sitting meditation. It's the practice of not practicing. So just say to yourself, for the next three days, or five days, or whatever it is, three months. My practice is not to practice. I'm and good at that. OK, good. <laughs> but make it conscious. And if you say, I'm going to not practice for seven days, and you feel like practicing on the sixth day, don't cheat. Yeah. Just keep it really crisp. Yeah. And then after the seven days, see how you feel. And the most important practice of all is being gentle to yourself not being mean to yourself. And um, the last thing I want to say is, if you start to feel something like that arise while you're practicing, like you sit down and you're like, oh, I think this is good, but then it happens, as best you can, notice that, call it thinking, let go, and come back to your breath. And if that is not possible, and this is applies to anyone who's working with difficult emotions in their practice, Make that, the folk, make that the object of your meditation, the agitation. So in other words, place your attention on it, lean into it, not the story of it, but the feeling of it. It makes my heart race, it makes me feel shaky, it makes my, feel, it makes my head feel like pressure, whatever it might be. And when your attention starts to stray from that, and you have to use your own judgment on this, bring it back. And then when you're able to, go back to your breath. 
But you experiment with that, even just for like three cycles of breath, like bringing it into your practice. And then if you just feel like jumping up and stopping, take another three breaths of regular practice and then get up and rely on your meditation instructor. Um, one thing I will say, just kind of in support of the idea of meditation when it applies to people who have incurred trauma, is that when I do have a daily practice, it really sets a much better baseline. And that's like a literal baseline in my brain where I'm, you know, I'm, I'm much more relaxed. Not so much in, you know, like my body because I'm too big to be relaxed. But, you know, like when you're, the way you, the way you interpret things, mm -hmm. right? Because you, you could feel a certain way about something on a Monday and then by Friday just feel completely different about it. And it's completely the same. So... When I, have, when I have sustained a meditation practice, it has been extremely beneficial. It's just the trick of sustaining it. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hi. Hi. Uh, one of my biggest difficulties with meditating is uh, people often say, observe your thoughts. And to use a metaphor, if I'm, basically I feel like when I sit down on a cushion, it's like if I were to, to look at a superhighway, I can't really observe anything looking at a superhighway because <coughs> it's just a blur. Mm -hmm. And it's not like I can see one thought at a time. I just see a blur of like 10 thoughts every millisecond. So... Any thoughts on that? Uh-huh. Um, th the best thing to observe is your breath. And if there's a sense of you're sitting by a highway where there's, you know, a million things going by at a million times an hour, you're not uh, in any of those vehicles. You're sitting here and you're going with your breath. And you may have this sense that... So observe your thoughts is, I would say, not necessarily the pith of the practice. It's observe your breath, feel your breath, and if your mind becomes distracted by thought, observe that. Let go gently and then return your attention to your breath, but the breath is the home base. And so observe where your mind is rather than your thoughts. So Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, in terms of thinking about getting to that time where you're actually sitting in your 10 minutes or five minutes, and you talked about laziness as opting out or that sort of real firmness for with yourself on the other end of the spectrum. So mm -hmm. like, I'm not going to do it, forget it, or you must do this. Um, what does that middle look like where you might in some different way find yourself to your practice? That's a good question. Do you have, I'm not trying to turn it back on you, but do you have a sense of what the middle way would look like for you? The only word that comes to mind is some sort of relaxed thinking. I'll which go with that. It's hard to define. So you, you have a general sense of commitment. And it, uh, the my suggestion is make a commitment that is really doable, like super doable. Like I'm gonna meditate for five minutes a day on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for a month. And then at the end of that, I'm going to reassess, or 10 minutes, or whatever it is that you think you can do. And then when that doesn't work out, you know, you really try to honor that. But then, uh, then something will happen and you don't. Then your practice becomes gentleness toward yourself. And that, that's a very advanced practice. <laughs> and it's a very hard practice. And then go back. So you see, oh, I feel embarrassed, I feel mad at myself, I feel like I hate meditation. Whatever it is that you notice that you feel, just, oh, interesting, interesting. Those are thoughts you can observe. And then let yourself off the hook and come back again. It's always going to go like this. Oh, it's never not going to go like It's never going to not go like this. So make friends with that. And... Be kind and loyal to yourself. I'm sure you're doing your best, really. Okay, I think we have time for one more right behind you. I have a, an interesting 
thought that goes into my mind can you every hold time the mic I a little sit closer? down. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Every time I sit down, I start by focusing on my breath, and then my thoughts come in. I'm aware of my thoughts, and at one point they take me away, and just automatically, it's like a cycle. I go back to being aware on my breath, and it it goes back every time. I don't know if I'm practicing or it's just a natural state of mind. It's like that. So you are focusing on your breath, and then at some point your mind gets absorbed in thought, and then on its own it comes back to your breath. Yeah, on its own. Like Where I are you in all of this? Again, and then Where are you in all of this? Are you? So at some point I'm I'm, I'm aware, and then when it at some point I'm aware, and then when it takes me, I'm not anymore, mm -hmm. and I I just come back. I don't know how. That's awesome. <laughs> That's yes, you're practicing. <laughs> this is my professional opinion that you are but practicing meditation. Without any effort, though. Without any... Mm -hmm. Yes. Natural yes. Back. Because what happens, if I may be so bold, is you're focusing on your breath, you're focusing on your breath, and then you're like, hi, maybe I have cancer, or I wonder what's for lunch, <laughs> or wherever it, mm, it goes, or, God, the homeland is so great this year. I often think about how long my hair is getting. <laughs> I don't have the same <laughs> thoughts, but it's <laughs> <laughs> so at some point in this fascinating interchange with myself, something cuts in and goes boop, and then you come back. So that something hap you, you you don't make that happen. Something cuts into your mind stream and says, "Hello, you're meditating actually, so please go back to your breath." And then boop, you do. And that cutting through is really interesting. Like, where does that come from? And if you can do it, why can't you do it all the time? So that is a contemplation that I, I invite you to have with yourself. Where is that cutting through coming from? And it's quite, it always happens. And it's very natural and easeful. And it's like suddenly a light goes on. So that's good. That's a that's good practice. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you all so very, very much. Thank you, Susan Piver. And um, uh, thank you from Anna Maria. <laughs>